Deuteronomy chapter 7 tonight, we're doing what's called grazing through the book of Deuteronomy. How many likes grazing preaching? I like grazing preaching. And uh, uh, it just seems like you can get so many things in so many different areas with it. Lord, help us tonight to feed the flock of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater, greater and mightier than thou. You know tonight America is not a great and powerful nation because of our personal intellectual ability. This nation became a great nation because it served the Lord, because it honored the Lord. It's on its monies, it said, in God we trust. Amen? In its, in its pledge, one nation under God. And God has, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in this world. As far as population goes, what are we, about 5% of the world's population? I think the last time I checked. And yet this nation is so powerful. God could dry this country up. God could, God could take the corn and the soybeans and the cereal right off the shelves and the milk right off the shelves of this country. God has been good to this nation. And, and, and we are greater, might or not, because of just who we are, because of God's blessing upon this land. We need to remember that. And he said, verse number 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. You see, when you read this Bible here, you, you, that's why you need... Now, remember this. this. The Bible said, As newborn babes desire the sin milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. The church is compared as a mother. is typified as a mother. And the Bible is typified as milk. And you have, as it were, two breasts that the young Christian nurses off of and feeds itself in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you need both. And if you don't read both of them, you'll have a mixed up concept of who God is and God's character and God's nature. Let me remind you tonight that God is going to send the entire world to hell that rejects His Son, Jesus Christ. Physical death is nothing compared to going to hell. And that does not mean that God is mean, does not mean that He's not merciful, and that does not mean that He does not love them. But God is going to retain His holiness in spite of all of us. For if God were ever to forfeit His holiness, He could not save us. And He would lose even His own self. So keep that in mind. Now, in order to understand why God would say to these people, show no mercy, you need to read other parts of the Bible to understand the nature of these nations. They were going on these, these, uh, these Hittites and Girgashites and Amorites. They were a very vile, vile, vile people who were even offering their children to their gods in fiery, offering false religious services. They had perverted, immoral, religious ceremonies of the most debased filth you can imagine. And God literally, these countries had become so reprobate, God literally was going to wipe them out. Let me say something to you. As much as God has blessed America, America right now, the tabulation right now is that we have slaughtered 54 million babies since 1973 through abortion. This country is guilty of murder, of the innocents. And God is not smiling or laughing or nor amused in the least little bit about what this nation has done. And as much as I love this country and I hope that God will have mercy and give us a revival, I know that this nation deserves judgment. And I pray that God will stay the judgment and give us a space of repentance. I'm telling you, please pray about these elections. There are candidates out there that could come to the front and I, that, that could make a difference in this land. I see a window of revival in this nation. I really do. And, um, but understand that when you read about what God told them to do to these nations, understand where he's coming from here. And don't ever forget, not only did God... I, I'll give you this. God sent an angel one night and destroyed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Killed them. God is holy. And when a nation becomes so perverted and so rotten and so wicked, he will bring judgment upon that nation. 
Neither, you know, he said this, he said, make no covenant with them, nor show them verse, no, verse number three. Now watch this. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shalt thou shalt not give unto his son. Now you ought to just, that one phrase ought to teach you something about family, parental, children relationships. A father... Whenever somebody walks up to this aisle and we have a wedding ceremony like we did the other day with uh, had a little girl there and her husband, who gives this woman to be wed to this man? Is that just a formality anymore or do we really mean it? Do we believe that the father and the mother have the right to give that daughter in, 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 in holy matrimony? There's never a time that God does, a daughter is totally un all the time of her life to be under the authority of either her father or her... Under, and when I say that, I'm talking about the protection of her father. And when that father hands her off and gives her that husband, then she moves under the protection of that husband. Boys need to be taught this. You're taking over the responsibility that that girl had, that her father had over her. And as that father would give his life for his daughter, you should give your life for your wife. You should protect her and love her and provide for her. Amen. And we need... You say, well, that's chivalry. I like chivalry. I think women ought to be protected. I don't think men ought to cuss in front of women. I don't think they ought to tell dirty jokes in front of women. But now women have become so coarse, it's unbelievable. How many of you knows I don't care much for Oprah Winfrey? And if you're watching The View, you are sick. You need, you need, you need to get right with God if you're watching such low-down, hellish, sewer pipe, sewer lagoon stuff as that. And... Uh, those women who claim to be liberated are not liberated. They've been taken captive. They've been taken captive by Satan and uh, by this world's false philosophies. But God says here, you don't give your daughter unto their sons. Neither nor his, his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. You don't go to the heathen to get a, daughter, a, a daughter-in-law, and you don't go to the heathen to get a son-in-law. You don't. You don't. Have unequal yokedness in your in your life. Now, write this down. Well, let's just go there in Second Corinthians chapter six. Now, the Old Testament, remember judgments, the statutes, commandments, and now we're going to see the New Testament doctrine of it. Second Corinthians chapter six. Now, the casual reader would think, well, that's just you just buzz right through that. If you don't stop and meditate on that, and then do a scripture search on it, it won't mean much to you. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse number eleven. Everybody there, say Amen. Second Corinthians chapter six. Oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Now think about that. Paul is saying, my heart is enlarged to you. In other words, I'm giving you my heart. I'm not just preaching at you. I'm not just writing. I'm giving you my heart. You're not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. And here he's taught, here's where he comes. Verse 14. Be ye not. What? Unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know what that means? Do, ne- do not ever marry someone who is not a, a not, I will tell you this. Don't not just marry a Christian, but don't marry a Christian that's not a committed Christian. All right? Marry a committed Christian. And don't, how many knows one of the worst messes you'll ever get your life into is for a saved person to marry an unsaved person. Now, God can have mercy and that person could get saved. And, and God gives directions about that and instructions for that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the unbelieving and the believing. And he gives, in 1 Peter chapter 3, one of the greatest passages about a wife that has a husband, a saved wife that has an unsaved husband. And there's powerful passages of Scripture about that. But, oh, God is trying to save you a lot of misery, boys. Don't marry a girl that's not saved. And if you do it, you're in direct violation against the Word of God. That's a command from the Lord. Don't you do that. And you know what that means, fathers, to us? That if our daughters uh, become, you know, uh, if, uh, if, uh, an attraction and there becomes this here, you know, uh, uh, attraction and there becomes this attempt for a courtship to an unsaved person, we can't give our blessing on that. How can a father ever give his blessing to a daughter who's marrying an unsaved boy? How can he give a blessing to his son who's marrying an unsaved daughter? When God says don't do it, I, I submit to you that if we love them, we could never do that. I'll say something further to you. You better be careful about marrying Christians that uh, are, are, are wrong doctrinally. 
I mean, I'm not, you know, I know there's some doubtful dissertation, but you better be careful. You'll have a dog fight the rest of your life. You need to get some things settled. You know, the best thing to do is sit down and have some good old heart-to-heart talks. Listen, this is what I believe the Bible teaches. What do you believe? And uh, you'll find out the truth about it is that in our quest to get mates, we'll say things that we don't really mean. We'll hide things that we're going to hide, and we won't bring it out until after we're married. And so there's some things really ought to be talked over and so forth, and I want to encourage you in that. But he said, he said uh, don't be unequal yoked. He said, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? You know what God's telling you? Listen, there's going to be so much of your life you're going to miss by marrying somebody because you can't have fellowship. I mean, how can, how can an unsaved husband have fellowship with a wife who loves God and wants to read the Bible and pray together? How are you going? You're living in two different worlds in the same house. And God's trying to spare you that. And I would just encourage you, wait on the Lord. Amen? Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. You ought to underline that. Be ye separate. Underline, come out from among them. Saith Reggie? No, saith the Lord. Saith the Lord. This is God's instruction to us. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Hosea tonight on this thing. Go to the book of Hosea. All way back over there in... Right after the book of Daniel. Right after the book of Daniel. I'm sorry. I think I, I, I'm, I gave you the wrong Ezra. I'm, ta- I'm sorry. I said Hosea. I mean Ezra. And Ezra is back over there around Ruth, ain't it? Right before Nehemiah. Ezra will be right after Second Chronicles. In case you're like me, you don't, I don't turn to Ezra real frequently. And I have to kind of, I kind of, oh boy, said to make sure I get it right. But Ezra chapter nine. Now Ezra, remember, is is a is a book about re- return. It's about returning to Jerusalem. It's return to the land, and it's returning to the ways of God. Ezra was a scribe, and uh, I want you to see how important these people took this this passage of scripture in verse number. Now, if you get Ezra chapter nine, I want you to hold Deuteronomy chapter seven with your thumb. This takes skill now. It goes like this, all right? I'm just being honored tonight, all right? But I want you to look at verse number 4. Okay, verse number 4 in Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse number 4. He said, he's, verse 3, he says, don't marry unbelievers. Now, in verse number 4, he's going to tell you why you're not to marry. It's, it's more than about not having a lot of fellowship and so forth. Here's what God says will happen. He says, for they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. Now, he says, if that happens, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Okay? Now, that's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? God says, don't do it, because he said, if you do, they will turn your heart away from serving me. All right? You'll turn your heart away from serving me. Now, Ezra chapter 9, let's look at chapter 9, verse 1. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me and saying, the people of Israel and the priests of Levites have not what? separated themselves from who? The people of the lands, doing according to their what? Abominations. Now, that's what I was talking about, why God was going to destroy them. Even to the Canaanites, Hittites, per- well, we read about those earlier, didn't we? And the Egyptians, Amorites. Verse number 2, watch what it says. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. Is that not a direct violation of what God just got through saying in Deuteronomy chapter 7? That is an absolute disobeying command of the Lord there. He said, watch this, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. God did not think that was funny. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Now, I don't want to get off into, well, deal, but you better, you better underline that holy seed part. You take that back to Genesis chapter 3. It's worth studying. There's something to this. Well, I'm telling you, there's something to it. You don't, you don't, you don't want to mess around with it. Um, 
He said that with people of that land, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Verse number three, and when I heard this thing, I rent my garment, my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head of my beard, and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Wow. How many of us think that it's that bad? We don't, see. We haven't been, we haven't been, this hasn't been preached, hasn't been taught. We just think, ah, it's no big deal. Verse number four, then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I said astonished unto the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Look at that. And said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to the captivity, to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondsmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou commanded thy, by thy servants the prophet, saying, The land which you go into possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to the other with their uncleanness. And, and can I say to you tonight, folks, that's what's happening in our country. It is being filled with uncleanness from one end to the other. Now, look at what he says, verse number 12. All this has been said and done, bringing it down to the violation of this one command. Verse 12. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trust, seeing that our God hath punished us less than our iniquities deserve. You all wonder why I ever say, how you doing, Reggie? I say, better than I deserve. Because if I'd have got what I deserve, I'd have been hell. It's, that's scriptural now. Right there it is. He said, and hath given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity. You see that? Join in affinity with the people of these abominations. And that's when he's talking, and it goes on down through. The whole issue here is the fact that they violated that one commandment. They were letting their sons, hey, 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 what's going to, if you lose your children and your grandchildren, everything else doesn't matter. It is important. God didn't just give that for nothing. And now I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 11 and see it in effect and how it destroyed the whole nation. 1 Kings chapter 11. I mean, it happens exactly like God said would happen. 1 Kings chapter 11. Verse number 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Hmm. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Amorites, Edomites, Zidon, Hittites. You recognize those people? They're the very people God said don't mix with. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. You just got through reading that back in Deuteronomy. And did you know something? The king was supposed to write himself a copy of the Word of God so that he would know these things and know what not to do. But Solomon, he's so high and mighty and so cocky and, and so covetous. I mean, there wasn't enough stuff. There wasn't enough, there wasn't enough wealth and there wasn't enough women to make this guy satisfied. All right? And he, God said, you've been told, in other words, that you said, you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon claved to thee unto these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives did what? Turned away his heart. Look what it said. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abominations of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as David, his father. Then did Solomon build high places for Shemesh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill 
that is before Jerusalem. And for Molech, can you imagine Solomon building an altar and a, and a deal for Molech where they offered their children in a fiery, bloody sacrifice and gave their babies to the devil? In the hill that was before Jerusalem, for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, likewise did he for all his strange wives which burn incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And you know the story. The kingdom, the nation of Israel split God, and they went into captivity over what? The first thing God says about Solomon is he married strange wives. This is not, this is not little stuff. This is not little stuff. You may think that little girl's the sweetest thing in the world, but she's not a Christian. Your, your grandchildren are probably not going to get saved. You may think he's the nicest little thing since milk toast. If he's not saved, let me tell you what the first thing that happens. You, you find if they'll turn your your child. They will turn. I want to tell you something. This world's pull. They will turn your child's heart away from God eventually. If you're not careful, that's tough stuff, ain't it? That's good. God's trying to help us. God loves us. Amen. God loves. Us. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter seven. Verse number 5, Thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. <clears throat> I don't think God wants you to have anything to do with their stuff, right? Can I tell you something tonight? Just be, I want to be real, real strong. Whatever you do, don't marry outside your faith. You know, there's no perfect, but whatever you do, don't marry a Jehovah Witness. Don't marry a Catholic. Don't marry a Mormon. I don't care how pretty she is. You are fixing to mess your life up and your generations up. Don't do it. You don't do it. God says, don't have nothing to do with them. Verse number 6, For thou art a holy people and the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Now watch verse 10. Mark verse 10 in your Bible. And repayeth them that hate him to their face. Did you know God's not going to sneak around to get you? God's going to come right up to your face and repay you. He will repay you to your face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. I want to encourage you something tonight here. Uh, Christians need this every once in a while. You're going to get done wrong by some people in life, right? You're going to get scoured by this world. You're going to get stomped on. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Let me tell you something. You're going to get some bad deals. But I want to remind you that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And God will repay people to their face. And God will write the last chapters. And the last chapter may not come to the great white throne judgment. And that's a long time from now, right now. But God will write the last chapters. You can mark it down in your day book. God is going to repay them to their face. So just... Give it to the Lord. Trust the Lord. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to even fight it. The battle is the Lord's. God will. Re You're to pray for your enemies, not kill them. Okay. So vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And that's Romans chapter twelve. You don't have to worry about it. God will write the last chapters. You may die and not see the last chapter done, but don't let it tear you up. God's going to bring everything into judgment. And I want to encourage you. He will repay him to his face. Let's look at verse number 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to do these judgments. Now remember, we're not talking about salvation in the law. We're talking about governance, right? We're not doing these things that God says to do to be saved. We are doing them because we are saved. We want to obey the Lord, keep his commandments and the judgment statutes because we are saved, not to be saved. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection, his shed blood in our place for our sins. These things are written to govern your life. So God's saying, I want to govern, if you're mine, I'm going to govern your life. Don't marry, don't marry outside the faith. All right, verse number 13, he said this, and he will love thee. Number one, isn't it good to know that God loves you? I think I'm sure glad God loves me. Look at the next thing and bless thee. Number two, I love you. Number two, I bless you. Number three, multiply thee. 
And he will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land. You know, I think God likes children. What's, it didn't say fruit of the loom. It said fruit of the womb. Amen. Fruit of the womb. What is the fruit? It's our children. Oh, folks, listen. You know what kind of once in a while really keeps me going around this church? Some of these little kids run up to me and hand me a little paper, and then they'll just kind of look down and take off. And I'll open up that paper, and it's got one of them, you know, them drawings and stuff, you know. Or they'll be, you know what's amazing? This is the truth. I have at the house, just here recently, one of the kids at this church sat down and wrote almost the whole first chapter of Deuteronomy, I think. I didn't read it all because I couldn't quite read it all, but it was, and they was writing it verse by verse. You know, isn't that a blessing? That tells me God's going to use the preaching of His Word and the teaching of His Word in their heart and their life. But you know, the fruit of the womb is such a blessed, blessed thing. Oh, listen, God says that's a blessing. I want to thank and, and I encourage all the families of this church. You know something? Uh, it's good to have children. Amen? That's a blessing. Children are a blessing. They're your wealth. Now, I, I, I want to say something a little personal tonight to you. I, uh, I've kind of burned my candle to both ends. I've kind of cut out that way. Uh, I mean, you know, I just always got something. Karen, I asked Karen today, I said, do you know how many projects we've had since we got married? She said, I don't even want to think about it, much less count them. You know, I'm always trying to, I've always got some idea, and I'm always doing something, you know. And I've, and I, and I've, I've preached hard, and I've worked hard, I mean, in the work that I do. And a lot of people, if you don't think what I do is work, go with me for a while, okay? But what I'm saying is, I probably feel like I'm a little more wore out, wore out than I ought to be at 57 years of age. But you know something? There's a lot of things I'm doing right now I would not be doing at all were it not for my children. I'm telling you. A lot of people ask me, Reggie, how do you get done all that you're doing? I'll give you the secret. I get my kids to do it. (laughs) But it's a blessing because things, it gives them opportunity. And, you know, it's just a blessing. I don't know how to say it other than that. But you know what I figured out? My kids are my wealth. I was told that about 20 years ago. If you raise your kids for God, they will be your wealth. And I'm not saying that you should set your kids out to work for you so you can sit around and do nothing. I'm saying to you that your kids are your wealth in many, many various ways. And our forefathers understood that, and we need to re-understand that. And we need to see our children as a blessing. God, if God sees children as a blessing, we ought to see children as a blessing. Now... I want you to remember something as you're reading this, that this nation, I believe, is already under curse several reasons. When we look at this, uh, he said, He'll bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, thine oil, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep, in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Look at verse 14. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. Can I say to you that I really know and believe in my heart America has been blessed above any nation I've ever heard tell of in all of history and still is. And you know why? Because we were a nation found upon the Word of God. Now watch what he said there. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. Hmm. I, I, I've, I've addressed this subject before and I'll address it again tonight because it's important and it's very personal and stuff. But uh, uh, God says some really specific things there. In fact, let's read the next one there, verse 13. God, and I will take away from thee some sicknesses. All sickness. How many knows America is a sick, physically nation? We are literally. Uh, medical care right now is one of the biggest issues in America. You know, and we're not, here's, here's what really gets me. We're not talking to American people about how to prevent disease. We're talking to American people how to pay for their hospital costs. We're not, that shows you the lack of leadership that's in this country. We're just thinking about how we're going to pay for all this. When we ought to be saying, hey, you know what? Does anybody ever think we might ought to go back to the Bible and we might ought to honor God and maybe that all the sickness in our nation is just a general curse upon our country? And may I say to you that Daniel, although he was a godly man, was carried into captivity. And just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to escape the curse of, or the judgment of God upon this nation in some areas of your life. And I'm going to say something to you. You know, the sexual revolution that America had back in the 60s, buddy, we're going to pay for it. Now, I want to throw something at you. He's saying here about some things, and there's other passages of Scripture that relates to this. What's the number one problem with cattle? That, does anybody know what? You, you used to at least have, have to. It's still, still a major deal. It just keeps coming back. They, they kind of use it for monetary policy anymore. But the one disease in cattle that has to be dealt with, you better, take, you better do it in your cattle. You won't have any cattle. Bane's disease. That's exactly right. What is Bane's disease? It's a disease that causes the, the cows to abort the baby calf. But at five months or younger. 
And the veins were called bursulos. If it gets into a herd, it will devastate. It will decimate an entire herd of cattle. And it is a very th- critical thing. God has said that in the other passages of Scripture that's related to this, that if we abide by His Word, if we let the Word of God govern us, that our, that our young, that, that our animals even, and our mothers will not cast their young. I submit to you that, that uh, losing our children in miscarriages in this country is an evidence that we're not living, that we're not being letting God govern our life. Now, listen to me tonight. You would be surprised. I would submit to you that probably nearly... And Karen and I, we've experienced this, and it's a very devastating, tough deal, tough deal, miscarriages. But if you, it, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't even know that miscarriages are all over this country. I mean, night and day is miscarriages. It tells me that, I mean, have you ever thought about it? It just seemed like disease is just pouring in on this nation. I mean, the next day, you don't go through a week before what, somebody else has got cancer, somebody else has got this, somebody else has got this. It's just like we are being bombarded. When I read this passage of Scripture, I'm saying, you know what, America, why don't we repent? And that's the best health care program we could ever have is to repent, get back and letting God govern our lives. And I'll say this, and, and, and I don't care if this sounds old fuddy daddy to you or not. If God says some things aren't good to eat, and, you know, I know you can eat and be a Christian. That has nothing to do with your salvation, but it might have something to do with how well you, your health is. And here's what I'm going to tell you this. Uh, we're not walking behind the plow much anymore. <clears throat> I'm going to get myself in trouble tonight. You know a good way to be sick? Is ride an air-conditioned tractor cab and get out and get the baler unstuck in the 90-degree weather. I, I like air conditioning, but air conditioning don't like me. And I'm saying something to you. We live in a corruptible body that needs to sweat. And it needs to let the toxins out. And if we keep ourselves in a controlled climate all the time, you know, and here's what gets me. We'll sit all day in an office that's air-conditioned, then we go down to the club and... I don't get it. We'll go down to the club and want to sweat it all out, you know, and then we'll go back to that air-conditioned office. And then we eat moon pies and drink RC colas and wonder why we're sick. I mean, you know, if you read the Bible, you'll find out that God intends for you to eat some roughage so you ain't constipated your whole life. Did you know constipate? You say you shouldn't be preaching about that. Well, this I'm preaching Bible, amen. God says these diseases, I'm going to tell you, colon problems are the base of most sicknesses. And our stomachs need to be cleaned out. How many has ever had your tolls to get stopped up at your house? Your, your lagoon system stopped up and you had to have it. You know, hey, your pipes is just about like those pipes. Every once in a while it couldn't get clogged up. You might need to you know, clean it out every once in a while. That means you might need to stop eating for about three days. And give your body a chance to cleanse itself. And you might need to start eating more fiber. Now, don't anybody take offense at this. But don't ever feed me white bread. If you're going to give me a sandwich, give me whole grain wheat bread. Because that white bread, it looks like it should be wadded up in a ball and thrown at somebody. Not eat. I'm trying to help you. Did you know what? You stay, give us this day our daily what? Bread. bread. Now, you know what the world has done with bread? They've done just exactly what they've done with the Bible. They go up there and they take that wheat and they grind all the goodies out of it so they can sell it. And then they pump in two or three little vitamin A, B, C, and D so they can put on it, uh, enriched with vitamin D. They done took all the life out of it, sold that to the cattle feeding people. And then they want you to eat that. And you're eating bread that ain't got no life in it. I'm telling you the truth. Most bread you're eating doesn't have an ounce worth of nutrition in it. And the moral of that story is make good homemade bread and give it to your pastor. Amen. <laughs> the, did you know we have a saint in this auditorium? Anybody that gives me homemade bread, they're a saint. Saintess. There's Saintess Lawson back there. She makes homemade bread and gives me every once in a while. Amen. No, I'm serious with you. You know what? I'm just saying to tonight. You know, I don't want to come visit you in the hospital if I don't have to. And if I can get you to eat right and exercise right and sweat real good, get some of that meanness out of you and that wickedness out of you by sweating, get you a whole way, man. I still say the best exercise program, some of you ladies like to lose weight, buy you an exercise machine. I'll sell you one here at an auction. It's called a push lawnmower. 
Wonderful exercise. Don't buy one of them $1,700 deals. Buy you a $25 used and buy one that don't start good. <laughs> because then you can get mad at it and run around and kick, kick the stupid thing like that. Then you get all that exercise. <laughs> uh, this is, I don't know where this is going to. Amen. <laughs> Maybe I better go on to the next verse. You reckon? But you read that. He said, there'll not be male or female among, barren among you or, your, or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from thee all sicknesses and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt. You know what that tells me? That God was allowing evil diseases to come upon the Egyptians in judgment because they would not follow the Lord God of Abraham. Which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thine eyes shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. If thou shalt say of not heart, those nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them. God does not want you to be afraid of big numbers. You know what? The average person right now thinks that, the, oh, the liberals and the news media and their well, in the educational system, there's just no way that we can, you know, we're just going to hide in the corner till the rapture of the church. That is not a biblical attitude. God says, if God be for you, who can be against you? Amen. You remember whenever Elijah's servant went out that morning and he saw the armies of the people around there and he said, oh, Elijah. And you know what Elijah said? Lord, open his eyes. He said, they that be for us are more than they that be against us. Don't ever, ever forget that. If God be for you, who can be against you? And we need some people who really believe that and are not afraid just because they're greater in number or greater in money or greater in power, worldly power. I'll tell you what, listen, we need that kind of leadership in this nation. And, and I want to encourage you in that. It's what God's teaching them. But in verse 18, but thou shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did in the Pharaoh and all the Egypt. In, uh, and all the Egypt. Man, if you'll well remember and look at what God has done for people in the past, you'll, it'll give you encouragement for the future. Verse number 19, the great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them, until they that are left and hide themselves from thee be destroyed. That is the neatest passage of Scripture I nearly ever read in my life. God sent an angel down and said, Mr. Hornet. Can you imagine an angel going up to a hornet's nest and saying, Hey, you hornets, there's a bunch of Hittites over the hill. Go get them. They're hiding under the bushes. Over. Go find them. You say, My land of living, that's our God. God uses the little things, the things that the world doesn't think anything about. We've got a great God, amen? I think God gets a kick out of taking hornets. I don't tell you, hornets will put you on the move, amen? <laughs> hornets will put you on the move. <laughs> Isn't it neat that God says, I'll just use a little old simple hornet to get them people out of your way and to defeat them in front of you? How many ever heard of a bullet called the hornet? There's bullets called hornets. Just a little thing. Somebody might have been reading the Bible when they named them. Anyway. Well... Verse 21, Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. I always like what Patton said, and I'm not a great big fan of General Patton, but you know what General Patton said that was right? He told his men, You let them die for their country. You kill them and live for yours. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I like that. I mean, we need to be willing to die for our country, but it's better to live, to let them die for their country, and let's live for ours. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. You get the right kind of leader, you can have the troops scared before you get there. I'm going to tell you about Patton. He was so confident that he had, he had the opposing army scared while he was moving toward them. He, he, he knew something. Patton knew something. That if he had confidence and boldness and courage in the face of, of that thing, that it would scare his enemies before he ever got there if he developed a reputation as a general. And it worked. Yeah. Anyway, verse number, you know, and I, I want you to translate that into confidence in your God. Amen. I always like what, was it General Wainwright? 
who had been taken captive by the Japanese, you know, and was in a Japanese prison camp the entire time of the war. General Wainwright got news that that uh, Japan had surrendered, and he got when he got that news, he uh, he walked out of his cell, walked down to the Japanese general's uh, headquarters there, and said, "Get up out of the chair." He said, uh, "I'm in charge here now." He said, "My commander in chief has defeated your commander in chief, and I'm in charge." That man understood authority, and did you know what the Japanese general did it? Because he knew if he didn't. He might get a noose around his neck after the war. You see, he understood the powers behind. If you ever understand that if God be with you, who can be against you? It'll change your world. Verse 22, And the Lord thy God will put out these nations before thee by little and little, that thou, thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them. The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Now there's one more verse of this, and we're going to go home, and I'm going to make you all so happy you came tonight. Verse number 26, look at it. Neither shalt thou bring a TV into thine house. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't read that right. Neither shalt thou bring an internet. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it. And thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. I want to just encourage you tonight in just one little thing, and I'll let you get out of here. I'm not spiritual enough to have a TV as far as the channels where I can go and turn it on and, and the program comes up. I had some folks in church this morning that gave me a stack of war videos I'm anxious to get home and watch. I love, I mean, I, we've got a TV set there, and I can play CDs on it, and I know that can be dangerous. But at least I can really, can, I don't have to worry about my daughter walking in, hitting the TV, and some filthy, nasty bunch of junk popping out on that thing. And, and I'm telling you, listen to me, satellite and these, channel, these cable channels where you, can, where you buy these packages and stuff, they are as dangerous as a cock can, and you know they are. There's not a package out there that doesn't have a bunch of filth in it. You know I'm telling you the truth. And I want to encourage you tonight. Now, it's not your salvation, is it? Everybody understands it's not. You know, the Bible does not say, you know. But he said it will curse you. And I want to challenge you tonight. Be really, really careful about what you let come in your house. I've told, I don't, you know, I'm not very computer literate. Or what do you call it? Literate. I am computer illiterate. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you tonight. Listen, Brother Joel Friend told me a long time ago it's true. He said, raising the Internet is like driving into Springfield. Might be a little more dangerous, Joe. But he said, Reggie, there are streets you don't want to go down. And if you, don't, you, you know it's down or don't turn down that street. When you turn the Internet on, there are streets you don't go down. Now, I'm going to tell you all something tonight. I, I, I love to read the news. I feel like incumbent upon me to, you know, I want to know what's, you know, I feel like, you know, you need to know. But there's a limit to that. I don't need to know everything going on out there. I don't need to read every news story. I don't need to hear every stupid. It, why do they tell such stupid news stories that don't amount to snap, that only take you to, what, isn't there some good news? You know, I, I'll give you all, uh, Joel, can I give you an idea? Why don't you start a good news station? Do nothing but reporting on the good that happens in America. I've heard enough about the robberies, the rapes. I'm tired of reading stories about the queers. I think there's a wide opening. I wouldn't know how to make it happen, but I think there's an opening. But be careful when you turn that Internet on. I want to say something to you. Fox News, and I go to Fox News, and I'm thankful for, in a sense, for that Fox News. And I do believe it's, if it wasn't for Fox News, I don't know where this country would be at in the sense of the political landscape. I feel they've done a lot to help that. But I'll tell you, Fox News, the deal, I cannot go further than that one block because right below it, there will always be filth. I'm talking about filth, nasty, vile filth, pornography, right there below that main deal. Now, I mean, I literally have had to just commit to my mind that when I click on Fox News, I will not go lower than a certain point. 
And that's Fox News. And I'm going to tell you something else about news. It's getting more and more that they're reporting very vile stuff. And there's a, there's a danger in that. That is, it desensitizes you. Listen to me carefully. The Bible says in the book of Peter in the New Testament that Lot was vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. Vexed means he was gradually wore down to where it, it didn't shock him anymore. You see, that's why the sodomites want something about themselves in the news all the time. Because they know the more you hear it, the more desensitized you'll get to it. And pretty soon it's just, you know, ah, it's just, you know, just nothing. It's no big deal. That's the way it is. That's part of our culture, blah, blah, blah. No, it don't have to be. It, they want you to get to where you don't see it as vile and wicked and perverted and abomination as it, it really is. That's their goal. And God knows that if you bring a cursed thing into your house, that you will eventually be vexed by it and desensitized by it, and pretty soon you're listening and looking and watching things that you used to would have known instantly that is something I should not be around. The Bible says this, make no provision for the flesh. No provision for it. Your flesh doesn't need any help to be wicked. David didn't have Internet and David didn't have TV. David probably didn't even have Playboy magazine. You don't need it to get in trouble. But if you put gas on a fire, and let me tell you something that's going on all over this country. This is sad. There are in the dozens of preachers being taken down every week in America right now through Internet pornography. Dozens of preachers every week are going down over it. You know why? Because a lot of preachers are using the Internet right now to do biblical studies, supposedly. Can I tell you something tonight? If your husband's in, in the uh, uh, room in there on the Internet at 3 o'clock in the morning, he's not doing Bible study. Yeah. He, he's not studying the Bible. Can I give you some more advice? Keep your Internet open. I, do not allow it to be in a place or the door to be shut if it's in a room. There is not a daddy. There is not a mother. There's not a young boy, there's not a young girl in this church, but what could not be destroyed by the Internet that you have in your home. I'm telling you, the best young person in this church house see the wrong thing and get hooked. And as I said this morning, can be drifting in this church house for two and three years until it erupts into something you wouldn't believe. So I want you to take that over. He said, thou shalt not bring into abomination in thine house. So I will say this to you. And I mentioned to Sarah here a while back. Sarah and I, I want to really stay after Daddy to do this. I told her, I said, I want any Internet that we have blocked. And I think you can get these blockers. Is that right? You can get these things that blocks. Joel's that, what do you call them? Um, anyway, they'll block uh, profanity. And they'll bro block uh, pornography and those kind of things. I would encourage you, if you're going to have that in your home, get it blocked. Get it blocked. Okay. And be careful about what you're listening to. Let me tell you, every movie you're ever going to watch in your life has an agenda behind it. Every one of them. Every one of them. They are not little isolated, harmless things. They've, they've got a message they're sending you. Movies used to, like, has anybody, what was the message Roy and Dale Rogers used to send you through their movies? They had a message. A good, yeah. Good is good, good is right, evil is wrong, and the bad guys always lose. Did you know something that's a biblical message? Did you know the bad guys are going to lose? It's a biblical message. But nowadays, you know what they're teaching you? The bad and the evil are the sharp, cool people. And you can do it and get by with it. There's a whole different agenda in, in the movies and the, and the th things that are being put out. And you can think, and I'm going to say this tonight to you. Please, please, don't let the TV babysit your children. Don't say go in and watch TV a while. That's not wise. That is not wise. And uh, I just want to encourage you tonight. Watch these things, okay? And uh, I'll tell you what you'd be better off doing. If your child, if the only muscles he's got in his thumbs, get him a good garden hole for his birthday. <laughs> Buy him a split mall for Christmas. Here, son, here's your split mall and a wedge. Happy birthday. Amen. Buy your daughter a new chainsaw, a little Mac, little Mac, amen? Get them outside. Get them to working. Get them working. I'm going to tell you something. The, lab, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. 
And you're a lot better off to have a clean mind and a wore out body than you are to have a corrupt mind and a body with all kinds of energy. And I love you tonight. Let's go home. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's stand together.